Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. Hello. Hello there. <laughs> We're going to get right into our show today because it's pretty busy. First, you're going to talk about carrier-based obturation. And then yesterday, we had the opportunity to Zoom with Dr. John West, and he's going to talk about an article he recently had published in Dentistry Today. And then we're going to close with a, a fan favorite, What Phyllis Thinks. So does that sound good to you? Let's get started. Okay. Today we're going to have another lesson on how to fill root canal systems. Of course, the way we originally filled root canal systems was using the shoulder technique, warm gutta percha. Electric heat carriers, in the old days it was Bunsen burners and electric uh, heat carriers came a little after that. And then we had pluggers and we would manually condense. But look at the work he was able to do. The shapes are appropriate for the roots that hold them. And he taught us all about the importance of shaping to facilitate cleaning so we could get these kinds of results. Really nice curvatures, lateral canals. You can see they're all here. The anatomy was understood to be existing way back then. And so was vertical condensation. And of course, the emphasis in this technique were described to us in two classic articles. Uh, the first one, just chronologically, was 67. That was filling root canal systems. And then the most quoted shaping article on the planet Earth. It was written in 1974, and so he gave us kind of the Bible of how to shape and how to clean and how to clean and how to shape. And then we could fill root canal systems using his technique. And so we practiced this. Schilder never gave exact numbers. Uh, what's the last file to link? There was always a concept, and it was building some deep shape and taper to hold not only our irrigates, our irrigations, and let our material stay inside the roots filling. So when you have that deep shape, those increasing cross-sectional diameters, that serves to limit our irrigants from getting beyond the foramen, and it tends to hold our warm gutta percha during packing. So this was the Bible, and of course, anybody who did this would begin to accumulate some exciting cases. And I show you several pallets of these nine different images just to show you differences, but you can see how much fun it is when we warm gutta percha and compress it into roots. You can see the prevalence of anatomy too. Got a little offshoot here. Really exciting stuff in this case. Multiple recurvatures and POEs. So the thrill of the fills we've talked about a lot. So that's what could be gained with some shaping and with some ideas with disinfection, even with a handheld syringe through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, you could see we could fill root canal systems. We could do this as easily as you could do lateral condensation and in the same amount of time. It's kind of funny how so many companies have come along and introduce needless complications to non-existent problems. We can fill root canal systems. We don't need $100,000 devices, nor do we need $70,000 devices. We just need about a $1 idea, a $1 idea. Well, now that brings me to my dear friend, Ben Johnson. Uh, ben Johnson thought of another way to warm gutta percha. So Ben came out of Baylor, that's a Texas school for you international people, and that was in the late 60s, I believe. And then within about 10 years, about 10 years from graduation, he wrote an article in the Journal of Endodontics, 1978, I believe, I think it was June of 78, uh, a new gutta percha technique. That was his article. And he described a way to simplify the shoulder technique. So we're still gonna use pluggers, but they're gonna be inside a circumferentially wrapped core, that's the carrier, and then the alpha gutta percha is around that. So Ben introduced the article in 78, and it took another decade for his company to form in 1988 
and it was a thermophil company. Okay, and then it became much more than that within just a few short years. I want to acknowledge Ben as a dear friend. We've traveled around the world a lot together, and when you're on the road for two or three weeks at a time, and you get up and you go in and do your presentations, and then there's the evening dinners, and then there's the plane rides and the transfers to new cities. So I got to know him quite a bit, but he's quite a hunter. He's a super athlete in his day. He loved it. Drafted by the Dodgers. How about that? The Dodgers just won the championship, played college football. Inventor and the co-father, at least the father of the co-father of Nitai. And then, of course, carrier-based obturation. So, Ben, check on all the boxes. You did it all. So, what did he think about? Well, he thought about a way to have a single unitary device with a solid core. It used to be a metal file. That was in the 80s. Then it became a plastic. I don't like plastic. Let's say polymer, polysulfone carrier. And that gave it more rigidity and flexibility with this alpha gut aperture wrapped around it. So you can see, uh, we'll bring in the uh, acknowledgments. But Jose in Spain did a beautiful case with uh, gutta core. That's uh, the latest and greatest carrier-based obturator. So the cores have gone from metal to polymers. And now the carrier is actually all gutta percha. Different formulation for the core and a different formulation for the circumferential alpha gutta percha. Okay. And then Giuseppe. I've learned so much from these guys. So who has taught me probably the most about this technique and got me to kind of rethink the shoulder idea, love the shoulder idea. It's as relevant today as it was the day described that the technology is made easier for everybody. But the fact is, as a teacher and teaching around the world, people want to go quickly and effectively and they want to be complete. So carriers can be put in a route and you can completely seal the canal and its related root canal system in seven seconds, seven. That's a lot easier than learning how to plunge in with the shoulder heat carrier, deactivate, take out a bite, and you can go back and watch the other show. So Ben wanted to make it easier for the masses and he's encouraged tens of thousands of dentists to quickly and effectively fill root canal systems. So I learned a lot from Giuseppe Cantatori uh, I was very down on this technique back in the 80s, as you might imagine. I was really over in the shoulder camp. But then I started traveling internationally a lot, and I saw Giuseppe's work, his chapters with Ben Johnson. I started to see the science, the histology, and it got me thinking Ruddle was wrong. There is another idea to warm gutta percha that everybody can do and they can do effectively. So just a couple cases. The limitations here is you're never gonna get your plugger, you know, more than about right in here because you start to enter the curve. And I don't know that you can heat gutta percha that far. That's too far. So we can say one thing about this technique. It is the only warm gutta percha technique that can deliver warm thermal softened gutta percha to the terminus 100% of the time. How about that? Okay, well, you can read, so we can have wall to wall. This is gonna be thermal softened in an oven. We can move it in wall to wall. We're gonna have cross link because the core is gutta percha. So this is gutta percha, and this is a different formulation than the outer alpha gutta percha, okay? You use the post space burr, post space burr to make the post space, okay? So it's easy to put a post in, and right after you seat this thing, there's plenty of research that shows we can immediately prepare the post space. When I say immediately, you might wait like a minute, okay? But you can immediately go ahead with the reparative, the operative procedures that follow. And we can take out, uh, the CBOs from gutta core way easier than the carriers that were plastic, the polymers. And then of course, the ones that were nightmares are pretty much off the market. That was the 88, that's the metal file that was the carrier. That was the original idea. And then it just got better, like everything else. So I wanted to show a really nice case done by a friend of mine, Sean Valiz. Uh, you can see in this case, it's kind of everything we just talked about. Notice that he put the carrier in, and again, this would have been a seven second fill. 
Notice that we have a system off of a system, a lateral canal off a lateral canal, if you will. And then, of course, he came in here with the post space burr to create this post space. So you can see in one shot what Sean was able to do to go right on to the restorative effort. And then back to Giuseppe, who I learned so much from Ben, Giuseppe, okay? And I want to acknowledge Bill Henson. Bill Henson taught me a lot about this, and I want to mention Steve Nimzik. You know, Steve Nimzik, I was a, the chair, the faculty chair at the Scottsdale Center for Dentistry, and I chose faculty from around the country to support my efforts. Steve Nimzik was the guy I brought on board to teach carrier-based obturation. Steve is very, very bright. I learned a lot from him. I'll never forget one session we had at Scottsdale Center for Dentistry where I was supposed to talk to the graduate chairs and the undergraduate chairs from dental schools around the country. And I looked out in the room and I said, there's Steve. I can't give this lecture. Steve, get up here. So Steve came up and I said, would you please just give your presentation to these chairs, these women and men, so they can go back and introduce this to graduate students. They did. In fact, we had probably 10 chairs from different dental schools that particular day after Nimzik's lecture say they were going to introduce this for the students to begin using on the clinic floor. Well, Ruddle threw his pen, so I'll go get it. Okay, so back to these guys that helped me learn a lot about it. Giuseppe, when he showed me his clear section analysis and his histology, it was, it was like, look at the webbing in here. Look at this webbing between systems. Um, look at the cross linkages. Look at the cul-de-sacs. And then he showed gutta percha in dental tubules, okay? So I became convinced that it was a wonderful technique and it simplified the shoulder technique. Well, what do you need? You need three things. You need a size verifier, you need the obturator itself, and then you need an oven. And the oven, we're always gonna work with gutta core, we're always gonna work on the first setting, setting one. So all gutta core obturation, setting one. So that's what you need, that's your armamentarium. Well, you look at the last file you carried to length, and just for fun, in this instance, we'll say that it was a wave one goal, and what it was was primary, and primary is a 2507. So if you take a 2507 to length, and you pull this file out, and you see that the file flutes are loaded, with debris, then you can immediately begin to think, okay, then what kind of a, a size verifier? Generally speaking, if you use a red instrument to length, you'll grab the red 25. Notice its taper is 045. What am I telling you? If you're using files that are greater or equal to 6%, so just to say clearly, because we're dentists, this is math now, it gets tricky. If it's six, seven, or eight, or nine percent, then when you choose the last file to length and carry it to length and can pull it out and it's loaded, you choose exactly the same colored carrier. 25, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, you get it, okay? The thing I'm gonna throw a curveball is if it's less than or equal to 4%, then you would select the size verifier that is one size smaller than the last file carried to length. So if you took a 25 to length, a 2504, you're going to pick a 2004 obturator. If you took a 4004 to length, you choose a 3504 obturator, always one ISO size smaller if you're in tapers of less than or equal to 4%. Okay. I got about five minutes. Whatever your working length was on the file is the working length on the size verifier. The size verifier must go to length and it must be loose, loose at length. You must be able to turn the file about a quarter of a degree, just you know a little bit back and forth. And that would demonstrate that the there's no mud down there. There shouldn't be after disinfection, please. But second check, okay. And then, of course, if that is loose at length, it says to you the carrier will also be able to go to length. And you can adjust the stop, just like you did, so you're working at the same length. 
Now, I don't like the handle, so we're gonna talk about in just a moment how to get rid of the handle, and I also don't like the stop, so we're gonna talk about how to get rid of the stop. Because if you look carefully, you'll notice there's a metric ruler on the core itself. And you can see the first little circumferential depth gauge is at 18, 19, 20, it skips a gap, 22, 24, and you even have lines that you might have noticed on the handle if you're familiar with this technique. So you can even get 27 and 29 for those really long systems and your working length then is proportionally long. So that's a little bit about that. Are you starting to have fun? Are you starting to consider you might be able to do this? Hey, this is probably the fastest growing obturation technique. All those single cone people in a swimming in a sea of cement, they're starting to think, well, maybe that's too much cement interface, especially in ovoid cross sections. Maybe I should be wall to wall cross linked gutta core. Uh, last file to length, red. Grab the red 25045. And if you can go to length and turn a little back and forth, good to go. I'll show this in a movie in just a moment. Okay, we won't have a discussion about sealer today because I've already had it. You can use pretty much any sealer that is available and can be confirmed and validated to be used with a warm gutta percha technique. So most sealers can. I still use this one. You might call me old fashioned, but you know, we have 60 years of research I want to bring your attention to this little note here. Anytime you use a zinc oxide powder with a eugenol base liquid, you get zinc eugenates, and eugenol makes gutta perch expand about 135%. Paul Eliezer, okay, at Alabama, he showed us that in this classic article. So you get expansion. You know, it's nice to use a uh, and, uh, you know, it's popular, so we want to use stuff that's popular, right? Because we're right in there with the group. You know, we're using those tricalcium silicate sealers, known as BC sealers. Well, they're very nice with their alkalinity. There's a lot of discussion about how alkalinity promotes what? Bioactivity, while simultaneously being antimicrobial in its behavior. So you're going to like that antimicrobacterial. Uh, feature. But listen, anytime you're releasing something uh, from a, a, a substance like cement and you're changing the environment, that speaks to what? A synchronization of solubility. And solubility means you're losing material and you're going to open the secondary leakage and that could contribute to failure. So we want stable, biologically inert cements. So I'll just say that this is what I'm still using. And you know what I like about these carriers? Can you put a paper point in a canal to dry? And you're going, Ruddle, I've been doing that forever. That's not magic. Think how easy it is. You don't have any obstruction up here. You have great visibility. You grasp it at the working length, right? So you know how long to go down. Well, when we get rid of the rubber stop and we break off the handle, if you can put a paper point in a canal, you can insert a thermal softened carrier and you have great vision and you don't have a bunch of pluggers and spreaders and cones coming out and a forest of stuff and you can't see through the access. So this is a very simple cleaned up technique. Now I mentioned some older people, Ben Johnson, Steve Nimzik, Bill Henson, Giuseppe Cantatore, the modern wave of people that you might want to go to the web and learn more from would be something like Manor House, okay? David Landwehr, Sergio Cutler. These people are big promoters of CBO obturation because it's simple, it's effective, and it's fast. Did I add one thing? It's reproducible. So the paper point dries your canal. There's gonna be a big change in paper points, no fibers, we're going to get a huge tamponade effect, about 400% more. We'll be able to dry. And then all of a sudden, guess what? In comes the cement. You can pick it up on your instrument. Little explorer pressure. Take a bead of cement. Wipe it around the internal aspects of the orifice only. That's all you need. Just like a squeegee is used to wash windows. 
when a thermal softened carrier goes in here, it's gonna squeegee that cement. That cement is a lubricant. You have to have the cement or the carrier with its sticky, tenacious alpha gutta percha is gonna grab those walls and it's not gonna wanna move. So the cement is the lubricant that helps you seat uh, the carrier in seven seconds. So there you go, that's all you use. You don't do anything more. I put sealer in a thousand different ways, I won't even explain it. This is the one I do now, just wipe it around the orifice, that's enough. Well, I'll tell you a trick. I do put sometimes a bead of it on the endoactivator, take the endoactivator suborifice and sputter coat the walls and you'll throw a real uniform layers Kerr pulp canal sealer along the length of that preparation. Okay. You can have the carriers lined up in here. You can push down on the elevator. It'll push that down into the heater well. So you hang the carrier by its handle, hang it very nicely so it's not, you know, skewed at some angle. You want to go right down into that well. So push it down. Within 20 seconds, within 20 seconds, the light will start blinking and that means you're ready to go. But maybe you're drawing a canal. Maybe you have two systems that merge. So you wanna block one so that you don't inadvertently seal both at once. You gotta seal them sequentially. So you might put a paper point in one, cut it off at the occlusal table so it's out of your line of sight, and then put the other one in. And anyway, you have 90 seconds, 90 seconds before this times out and turns off. So you have plenty of time, plenty of time. Grab it with your fingers, Pull it off the holder, take your cotton pliers and grab it right at the working length, just above the calibration ring that represents the vertical extent of treatment. Okay, then what? Ah, let's go, then what? That's where we break off the handle. Now you have this clean line of sight. Now we don't have like a big handle up here. Then we don't have our fingers coming around this handle trying to grab it. So we have a lot of obstruction. So make it easy and just grab it. And when you grab it, now you can take it right over. And I like to have you count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Sergio Cutler says, say one elephant, two elephants, three. Okay, elephant. 1,001, 1,002, elephant, you're gonna get it. Take time to get it down. It's a slow, steady, smooth insertion. And that internal plugger is driving gutta percha into all the anatomy. It's driving sealer under enormous hydraulic pressure. And unlike the old shoulder technique, you can always, in a well-shaped canal that's patent, you can drive filling complex, warmth complex, right to the terminus 100% of the time. Only technique. If you have enough swing space, you can move these back and forth and break this right off at there. No problem. If you're tight and you don't have swing space, just take a sharp spoon, pinch it against the axial wall, and it's out. That's good. And then we're just a few cases and we'll be done. So I've shown this case before, but the thing about it is it's one of the first cases I did with a carrier. So it's a bridge abutment. I hope you can see the furcal lesion and we won't describe everything, but we've done it before. There's a mandibular canal. You can see very challenging curvatures. Here's the size verifier after shaping. Notice it's loose. It can go back and forth with a little back and forth wiggle. Introducing sealer, just like I showed you. Now you can grab this. I didn't know the trick, so I used a plier, but you wanna use your hands like I showed you earlier. Now you can just break that right off and have better vision than I had. See, I don't have a lot of vision, but I have swing pattern, I have swing space. So back and forth, buckle lingual, and out that comes, and you can see uh, this is gutta core, but it's before they put the colorization in to make it pink. So it's still gutta core, just an earlier iteration. So you can see the carriers, there, you can see them there, you can see them there. So there's our carriers. My eraser is really nice today. And there's the post-op. I could have never got in the shoulder technique, my pluggers at most would have gotten down to about right in here, but I wouldn't have been able to go around the double curve. So still picking up hydraulics with that central core 
that's pushing that alpha thermal softened gutta percha everywhere there is vacated space. That's the key, vacated space. And then real quick, David Landwehr does gutta core. You can see his pre-op. This is about six months recall, but look at all the portals of exit. This is thrilling. One, two, three, and four. And you can see in this case, this is Carmen Bonilla. And look at the work she's doing. Beautiful, look at that loop. And then multiple apical portals of exit. That's a carrier. Remember, four canal molar, four times seven, 28 seconds, less than 30 seconds. If I exaggerate, in less than a minute, you're out of there. And you've done wall-to-wall -wall filling. And a couple more, Rigoberto. This is gutta core. This is gutta core. And who can obturate thermal soft and gutta percha around a 90 degree dog leg? Well, apparently, apparently Regalberto can. <laughs> and then that's my last case, Sergio. I want to acknowledge him. He's done a big work, a big effort, SEMs, a lot of analysis of obturation done with carrier based obturators, and it's all good. And you can see. You know, look at this multi-planar curvature, but you see the lesions kind of like that. So you would expect the portals of exit terminate pretty much where you see lesions. So the bifidity makes total sense to you. And then getting and keeping and maintaining that a little abrupt curvature apically, beautiful stuff. Okay, I hope I've got you excited to work on delivering thermosoften materials wall to wall internally. And then you will experience the thrill of the fill in an economy of time. Best wishes. Today we are joined by Dr. John West, an endodontist from Tacoma, Washington, to talk about an article he recently wrote and was published in the September issue of Dentistry Today. So you might remember John from a show we did last season, The Pro Taper Story, and that he's part of the Pro Taper team with my dad and Professor Pierre Mosh too. So welcome, John. We're really glad to have you back. Happy to be here, privilege. Thank you, Ruddles. Have you been doing well? Extraordinary. <laughs> okay, well, great. Between extraordinary and exceptional, it just keeps going up and down. Lisa. <laughs> so he's always vacillating between good and great. <laughs> there you go, baby. Okay, so your article, let's just get to it. Your article is called The Setup, Endodontic Predictability. And I read this article and I liked it a lot. And one of the reasons I liked it so much was because it's very different from just the average clinical article you read. And in this article, you focus on the mental game of endodontics as being key to predictably successful endodontics. So can you tell us why you saw the need to write this article? Excellent question, actually. Uh, I've asked it myself the question, Lisa. But if you look at the endodontic conversation in the world, whether it's Zoom or uh, meetings or advertisements or journals, it seems like the focus has become on the machine is responsible for the endodontic outcome, whether it's shaping files, cleaning, different irrigation systems, obturation, um, got to purchase sealers, et cetera. The world right now is focused on equipment, instruments, tools. And the distinction I wanted to make, and actually we touched it on it in the ProTaper story that ProTaper was, is more than a file, but successful and predictable endodontics is more than tools. And that's what I wanted to focus on is to remind ourselves that we are responsible for the endodontic fundamentals. Now, this is not a revelatory concept. It's been around for a while. Um, the mental state and rehearsal of, 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 a, of a skill um, the, is, for example, centuries old, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 23, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Shakespeare, 1599. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right, Henry Ford. Some men see things are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. 
But the best one is the little red engine. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And honestly, perhaps my personal biggest discovery in life, and I've been able to apply this to endodontics, is to see and think differently, to use my mind to control my brain to create the outcome that I want. And I'm going to change, I'm going to introduce a title, a subject at this Zoom meeting. And instead of endodontic predictability, I'm going to be talking, we're going to be talking about what does it take to create extreme predictability? Because if we do almost nothing, nature is going to help us heal 80%, 70%, 90% of the time. The difference is that little bit at the end. And I'm challenging the viewers of this program to raise your status, and me too, raise our status quo. It's the last bit in the Olympic champions. They basically all have the same skills as we do as endodontists. The difference is the thinking makes it different. And that's what the article's about. I'd like to say something, Lisa. Uh, I don't even know if you'll remember this because you're so damn old, uh, only probably exceeded by my elderly age, but uh, many years ago, you sent me a book by a guy named Timothy Galloway. Oh, and, yeah. And he wrote a book about the inner game of tennis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that book came, I think, in the early 80s, but it was written in 74 to kind of tell how it might have influenced your life back in that era. Because I, I listened to that tape over and over and over. And every time he said tennis, I said endo. Mm -hmm. Then I gave it to my uh, my son-in-law next door, Mozzie, and he listened to it. And then they gave it to my grandson, who has great aspirations, Noah, to be a professional tennis player. And so they were playing that stuff at night and affirmations and stuff. So really, maybe uh, if we have time, Lisa will ask you about the inner game. Yeah, I I think that it's a it's a book on tape. Is that what it is that he sent you? Yes. Okay, okay. So you know, I noticed, I, I want to just jump a little bit ahead because what you were saying, John, um, made me think of this, but you, you do say in your article that um, endodontic success is 100% minus X, where X is the clinician's ability, knowledge, and willingness. And I noticed that you did not say that X was also technology. So you are saying that, you know, this is not about reliance on the machine or technology. This is coming from inside you, right? So do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, knowledge is self-explanatory. If you're doing endodontics, you got to know what to do. Uh, ability is the skill to do it. Uh, the difference is the willingness. And the, the willingness comes from the uh, old English word here. I've written it down. Uh, Wallan, W-Y-L-L-A-N. And if you look it up, it means to wish or desire or to want. So to me, the willingness comes down really to intention. And it's a fine line because some of us are in different stages of our career. We have a different mix of patients and our willingness to take it to the next level is different for everyone. Sometimes you have to just get the job done. The next patient's here. You feel underpaid. Um, you feel um, that de dealing with that last piece of anatomy uh, isn't worth it. And it has to do with a conviction to understand the biology of endodontic disease, which is the same as any disease. And nature says to us, it wasn't our rules, it was her rules or his rules, however you see it, is that if one has a disease and the disease is removed, then the consequences or the sequelae of that disease also disappear. In other words, the symptoms are not persistent within themselves. So what the rationale of endodontics has always simply said and is often ignored is that any tooth that's endodontically diseased, it can be successfully treated if the endodontic anatomy, the architecture is eliminated through <laughs> cleaning it and making a little preparation and filling it up. So the willingness, 
uh, varies from person to person. And that is the probably the essence to talk, think about if one is thinking about, I want to always reach the end of the canal or I want a solid obturations or I want appropriate fillings, then that has, to, then there's a hundred billion neurons waiting to be nurtured and corralled to, um, to focus and, and actually get that, out, that outcome. And that's what the article is about. It's a, it's, it's a different article, but you know, in a way, Lisa, Cliff, Pierre, much too, and myself, um, others, this is what we've talked about all along. It's, it's, it's about the, not the doing as much as the being, the batter, not the bad. <laughs> Um, Dad, I know that you have, um, and I, I've seen a lot of your cases from decades ago before all the latest and greatest technology was available. It's outstanding work. So obviously that what technology wasn't the one factor that can tip you over to greatness. You know, like if you're, you were doing that before you had the technology. So do you want to say anything about that? Well, just briefly, because I want John to be our, the story is, but uh, what I learned from John's book that he sent me just to come back and tie that in, there's lots of other things, but the inner game and the outer game, uh, the outer game is your post-op x-ray. Uh, mm-hmm. As you go around the curvature, you can see that. The whole world can see, you can project it on the screen, you're short, you're long, you're too skinny, the taper's wrong. That's the outer game. So in tennis, it's the backhand, the forehand, the drop shot, the serve, second serve, all that. What I loved about what he sent me, Johnny, is the inner game is about overcoming anxiety, uh, self-imposed limitations, uh, lack of concentration. Some people get really close. You know, it's like six all. (laughs) and They're a tiebreaker. And all of a sudden, they can lose their focus. They start thinking ahead. Or they're way ahead and they start thinking too far ahead because they think they're already living in the next game. So it's the moment. It teaches you the inner game, you're in the moment. Okay. John, can you tell us a little? I know that in your article you talk about the think box versus the play box. So mm-hmm. maybe just talk a little bit more about what these terms mean. Sure. Well, in reverse, the play box is the is the actual result and the doing, as Cliff just mentioned. The think box is everything beforehand. It's the setup mentally for success. And the way I do it is the three by five card trick. So what it is I want, for example, there was maybe a few months ago, I was in the obturations I had discovered I was having some voids, small voids. And I don't know where it's written, but it must be written the first day of endodontic school Voids are bad. <laughs> Aesthetically, they're just like, you, you didn't get the job done. How did you screw that up? So that's not good for me and uh, not good. It doesn't make so much difference for the case, but you realize as a referral situation or every case becomes a signature and every signature becomes a reputation. And eventually the reputation becomes our legacy. So every case counts. So I wanted to correct this void situation. And so I wrote on a three by five card, I make solid packs. So it's a first person present tense, present tense I statement, basically six words or less. And what it says is it says, I make solid packs. It sounds kind of corny, but I put that sign in front of every time I took an x-ray, then I put it on this monitor I put that, I make solid packs on the steering wheel of my car. My wife says, oh, gee, there he goes again. It's right in the mirror where I comb my hair beautifully. I had one on the toilet. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you have them everywhere where you bump into them. And before you know- Did you have it on your plugger? I had it on my plugger. Good idea. Um, But if if you read the article, it has to do with attention density. Uh, actually changing, you can change your mind. It's that simple, but it doesn't work out that simple because you can change your mind about something, but it has to be repetition. The brain can be trained. The hundred billion neurons, a few of those can be trained, John, for making solid packs or whatever the heck you want in your endodontic outcomes, your endodontic predictability. And that's how you make the next step. 
is you corral your brain into seeing it differently. Um, may I share a simple example? Mm -hmm. There was a staff member a couple of years ago. Her name was Mary. Let's say her name was Mary. And she messed up all the time. Just couldn't seem to impact. The intent and impact were always different. So I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Mary's just doing a terrible job. I have to let her go. And the person in the mirror said, well, wait a minute, John. Why don't you try to see it differently? Why don't you, for the next half an hour, every time you interact with Mary, you get to use two words, yes and thank you. So there I was, Mary and I were interacting, and I was saying yes and thank you. And I bit, literally had to take a pencil or two my teeth and say, yes and thank you. <laughs> of course, I didn't mean them. That was early in the morning. And then around noon, I looked in the mirror again, came back in the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and the person in the mirror said, I said to the person in the mirror, rather, Mary is doing a great job today. And the person in the mirror said, John, as you change the way you see things, the things you see begin to change. And that's that's cool statement, except it has to be very frequent. So the three by five card trick is the way to keep telling the brain differently. And the brain will, because of its neuroplasticity, it will change. And if you read anything about neuroscience, which fascinates me because um, it's, the only, it's the only way I've been able to grow is to intentionally put the I statement in front of me. And when I do that, and I even did with this, this uh, Zoom meeting, I, I saw myself having a great time, being joyful and, and making a contribution that someone could actually hold on to and impact their endodontic predictability. Yeah, Dad, I know that you've done said some, you've always like had this kind of thing where you, you tell us to write set your goals down, post them someplace where you see it all the time just to change your thinking or to keep your thinking on that track. I know when I started working at the office, you said every time before you answer the phone, do a big smile and make sure you're smiling when you answer the phone. Cause it's going to change everything. Like it's, and, and look at yourself, even if you need to look at yourself in the mirror smiling, you've even said, and I remember sometimes I've been so angry and you're like, just smile. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, not now. And you're like, no, smile, really smile. And as soon as you smile, you kind of laugh a little bit and it starts to change. So you've always been kind of about that too, like really focusing on, on your thinking and to make positive change. Yeah, we'll have to do another thing with Johnny. We're not done yet, but it would be on attitude. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love the, Phil sent me something that was like a pyramid. <laughs> It was all about attitude and to just play off of John. I mean, you know, everybody wants to take a course, John, you're in big demand. You got the idea thing up South of San Francisco, I D E A idea. That's the organization. He's the endodontist and everybody comes and they want to get better. But what John offers is not only how to improve their skills, he'll hold their hand and he'll show them pressure and tactile control, but he also works with their mind. And a lot of the growth we've seen in our seminars and people exiting is because they don't see it quite the same anymore. So John, you do say one thing in your article that is kind of um, related to this changing your thinking. You, and I'm gonna quote exactly, you say, whenever you are stuck, for example, on your way to the apex, rather than do more or less the same, ask yourself, what do I need to do differently? So, yes, and so where that begins is the visual outcome, exactly what I want in the endodontic radiograph. So I would study the radiograph and see the outcome I want. I would feel that in my gut. Yeah. And then I would think, you're enough. You're good enough. You're more than good enough to do this. So I've got that blazed in my mind. And then I'm sliding down the distal buckle of a maxillary molar. And four millimeters from the end, the 10 file begins to slow down. So the natural reaction, because of our millions of years of DNA, flight or fight, survival of the fittest, the first reaction, it's not my fault, it's not your fault, 
the first reaction is to push a little harder. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go further. So then I have to do something different. So why would a file not go further? Four reasons, four reasons. One is dent and mud. So we have dentin that's clogged beyond the file. And two, it could be what? Collagen. And dentin, mud, and collagen, as Herb Schilder used to say, are the fatal flaws of endodontics. And when those, when the mud is present, the only way to slide through the mud is through three words. Restraint, restraint, and what's the third word? It's restraining. Yeah, restraint again. So you become <laughs> delicate, gentle, a little curve in the file, touch, irrigate, come back out, touch, irrigate, come back out. And you're not three millimeters from the end. You're actually a fraction of a millimeter because it's only blocked a few microns almost. And then suddenly you slide to the end. Or if it's collagen, then it acts like a trampoline, bouncing against it, bouncing against it. And the clinician says to themselves, I'm a bad dentist. Well, you're not a bad dentist. You're just bouncing against collagen. And that requires prolube and viscous chelators and so forth. And again, the delicacy. So that's one reason I can't go further. The second reason is I have the curve of the file. So I got to do something different. So the curve of the file doesn't mimic the curve of the canal. It's a big curve and I have a hook on the file. Or I have a big curve on the file and there's a hook at the end of the root canal system. So I have to, so in, I have to do something different in order to follow. The canal's there. It's just waiting for John. So you make a curve on the file. Try that. No, curve and then rotate and another curve. So it's got multiple planes of curves. So that's a second possibility of what I could do different. The third is the file's too big at the tip. So therefore, I would go to a smaller file. And the fourth possibility is I have restrictive dentin holding the shaft of the file. And the way to remove that is early coronal enlargement or um, envelope of motion. And uh, Cliff and John and others have uh, many videos and conversations about that, exactly how to do that. But those are four things you would do differently. So um, that's the key is if we keep doing the same thing, we're, you know, it's best to, it, we want to solve the problem early. We don't want to solve it later because if, if it were a block, back to that example, we have three millimeters of block dentin and that's just three times harder. So the answer is there, honestly, in endodontics, really there's no problems. There's just situations requiring smart thinking and that's what this article is about, being smart. Are you saying there's different values of X? Uh, yes. Carry on. Say more. <laughs> well, we started this off with uh, success could be 100% minus X, and I always understood X was, was Ronald. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. my That's frailties, my uh, insecurities, my lack of training, my uh, mistakes I might do, lack of focus, concentration. So, we, we have X's to deal with. I think in, in John's article, he talks a lot about... Um, building your own confidence and, you know, writing these little notes that you are good enough and you are capable so that when you do run into a problem, you don't just immediately have a meltdown and not be able to think clearly about how to problem solve. You just keep trying the same thing. And I think you want to, you know, try to have the mental preparation to then have the clarity of mind to be able to problem solve when you run into problems. Is that correct? Yeah, the seminal point, is, this is not visualizations or affirmations or kumbaya or hope. This has to do with intentionally changing our minds to change our results. If I may, I'd like to read that Harvard MBA study. Um, may, may I take two minutes to do that, Lisa? Yes, go ahead. It's a great example of how written planned goals affect later outcomes. And it was a 1979 Harvard study. And they asked the students, have you set written goals and created a plan for their retirement? And 84% of the entire class had no goals at all. 13% of the class had written goals, but no concrete plans. And 3% of the class had written goals and concrete plans, by wins, et cetera, like that, milestones along the way, measuring their progress. And the results were simple. One, 10 years later, 
the 13% of the class that had set written goals, but no concrete plans were making twice as much money as the 84% of the class that had no goals at all. Kicker is the 3% of the class that had both written goals and a plan were making 10 times as much as the rest of the 97% of the class underlined combined, combined. Now this article, Endodontic Predictability, is not about money, but you can apply the same thing. The same concept is to have the three by five card trick that I've been talking about. So let's say, uh, let's just say uh, what I want, let's say I break files and that worries me. So I don't want to break files. So I don't want to say, I don't want to break files because the brain here is break files. So what I'm going to write down, <laughs> is I am safe with my tie. How about that? That is a different thought process when I'm treating the patient, when I'm drilling with my rotary and reciprocation files. And what's on my mind is I don't want to break this. This is my friend, the dentist. I'm doing treatment for my friend, the dentist. I don't want to break. Oh, oh my God. That's what happens to the brain. So we have to say, tell the brain. It's just sitting there waiting. The purpose of our brain is to keep us alive until tomorrow. It doesn't want to do something different. It's so content. Homeostasis is working perfectly. But John wants to be safe with NITI. I never want to bust another one of those damn things. And so I have to change, take a bunch of these neurons and take a cluster and change the thinking so that when, I, when I'm slipping and sliding with NITI instruments, I have this different level of knowingness, confidence, and it shows up in my predictability. And what I want is I want, I am, I am experiencing extreme predictability. You write that one down, extreme predictability. <laughs> I think you did, we did um, that heart, we talked about that Harvard study, I think, Dad. I think you talked about it maybe in the first season. So it's good that, actually, thank you for reminding us about that. Um, we're about out of time, but I wanted to ask both of you um, to comment on this one thing in closing that John writes in his article that really struck me. You say, you might even ask yourself the ultimate critical question. Would I refer myself to me if I needed endo? Mm -hmm. Do you think you would? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question for uh, the audience to ponder for themselves. And you don't have to answer to anyone this question, but would you refer yourself to yourself? You, have, you need endo on the maxillary first molar. They're really curved canals, and you can't even see them on the x-ray. And the CBCT says there's four or five. Indeed, there might be four canals. And the, and the question is, are you the best your best, not am I better than Ruddle or anything like that, is am I my best? And if I am my best, is that enough to have the confidence to refer to myself? What about you, Dad? If it ain't, change your thinking. <laughs> Do you have any closing comments, Dad? Well, that's a great rhetorical question. I don't think it, it needs to be answered, but I think most dentists know honestly their skill level their abilities their training uh so many times you'd have a dentist who never referred to you right john never oh, really? never referred until it was his wife or him or her really? and, and then, you know you got the case they'd say well you know this one really has to work and of course in my mind i'm always thinking and the others don't but <laughs> anyway uh i think what john started this whole thing off with was so excellent because we're doing a lot of projects together right now and so it makes me think a lot about what we're doing but uh we always come at it that this is the solution you know if we just had a little better one of these and we've we're old enough after 40 plus years almost 50 years of practice that 
it isn't always about this. This can make it more fun. It can make it easier. It can make it safer, faster, and all that stuff. But I think uh, I would just close by saying that I was talking to Ben Johnson yesterday, and uh, we were talking about training and the residents in grad school and what he said unprovoked on Howard Ferron Live that he did it there as well, is he just didn't see the, the love, the passion. And that's something that is not in a book. And so you don't get that with this. So a lot of the joy and the beauty of endodontics and the harmony and really get excited in life is about uh, how we see it, how we get ready, to, like John said, mentally prepare to do it, prepare to win. And it's all a lot about attitude. Yeah, Sorry, it's pretty long. In for, for, most, for most of us, we don't need necessarily a new tool, but don't get me wrong. I love technology and anything that is present, that's out there or in here, that's going to make my job better. Uh, I'm, in, I'm engaged and enthralled. But most of us, rather than buying a tool, just need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> So Lisa, we should ask John, what is the three by five card he'll show the audience in leaving? What would it be, what would be the message? Uh, we'll give him a minute, because he's doing that Johnny Carson, you know, he's thinking. I imagine it's gonna be something like simple is better, adapt, have fun, focus yeah, on what you can do. Yeah, it is all those. <laughs> that, I got all those messages from your article. <laughs> well, for me, what I'm gonna write is I am Extreme predictability. Okay. Uh, okay. Extreme endodontic predictability. And that's okay. going to be levels I never even thought I could see, be, do, or experience. But I, like you, want to experience my best self. And the only way to do that is it's not over there. It's right here. Right here. Look in the mirror. Okay. I just want to say thank you for joining us. And if you haven't already checked out the article, please do it's in the September issue of Dentistry Today. And we'll at least, we'll have it in our show notes or at least a link to it. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, John. Thank you, thank you Cliff. So here we are again for our popular segment, What Phyllis Thinks. And before this segment, my dad actually came to me and said, um, is it all right if he doesn't be in on this segment because it's about mom? But I think that we actually want him here because we want to see your reaction. And you guys have such a, a nice chemistry that we like to see, you know, how you guys relate to each other. So if you don't hear my dad talking a lot, be sure to just watch for his expressions. Because he doesn't know what I think. So <laughs> this is the only this time he finds out. Yes. <laughs> okay, so these questions are going to be kind of revolving around health and fitness. So what do you think about exercise? I think it's absolutely crucial for good health in general, physical health and mental health. Okay, and what is your exercise program now? Is it, and how has it changed since the pandemic has arrived? Nowadays, I'm just doing walking on my own with my Fitbit, which reminds me every hour to get my steps in. And also my back DVD, which I've been doing since the early 80s, say goodbye to back pain. It was created by a doctor who also treated doc, uh, John Kennedy, President Kennedy, with his back issues way back in the day. And it was originally through the YMCA back when I did it and hmm. saved, saved my life. I highly recommend it. It's a combination of meditation, stretching, and strengthening. At 30 minutes, it's great. It seems like I remember my whole life you doing back exercises, yes. like pretty r routinely, like you don't miss them. No, it makes a huge difference. And the only time I didn't do them, I ended up in surgery. So I stick to it. Okay. Um, so you're currently involved in a remodel related to health and fitness. What is this project exactly? Well, since all the gyms closed and we have kids, you know, all the kids in the family, everybody is working out these days. So we had one extra room here in the studio that wasn't being used for anything. And I said, that would be a great place to have a family fitness center. So that is being worked on. We'll probably be finished by the end of this month. And what, what all is it going to have in it? Treadmill, a reclining bicycle, a rowing machine, weights, a chin-up bar, 
a balance bar thing along one wall for putting the straps around that you to use do your for ballet. strengthening. To do my ballet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, lots I, of mirrors. I, lots of mirrors. <laughs> and it's a good size room, so it will be fun. Okay, well then I, I plan to see, I, I think I'm going to see a lot of pictures of you taken in the mirror for uh, posted on social media, working out. <laughs> very solid, very solid. Yes, we'll do a whole show in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there certain foods or beverage crave, cravings that you give into regularly? I love cheese in any form. That is something dairy. I lived on a farm when I was a child. I love any dairy products. So I have to modify it a little bit, but that's my favorite go-to thing. It gives me energy. I, I think for me, cheese is a, a definite a necessity as well. Well, you guys have that French thing in common where you both spent time in France. So yeah, you never met they a cheese in life. Cheese, yeah. and cheese and bread for sure. Yeah. Okay. Are there any foods or beverages that you like, but for whatever reason you avoid pretty much always? Desserts. I only eat desserts when we travel this year. Not so much. No travel. <laughs> no travel. Um, when we when we're on the road, I always order dessert with a meal, pretty much when we go to a restaurant. But not sometimes not first. At home. <laughs> <laughs> not at home. Okay. Uh, and okay. Do you take vitamins? And if so, what vitamins? We both do. I have my little organizer things that I do for both of us. Um, vitamin D, zinc, um, lysine for good immune system. And vitamin C. He takes vitamin C. I, can, I can't take it, but I have fruits every day. Why can't you take vitamin C? It gives me a stomachache. Okay. And anything with vitamin C in it, instant stomachache. It's a great diet. Then you can't I think eat. I pretty much overdose on chewable vitamin C every day. <laughs> you are definitely a student of Linus Pauling. I love chewable vitamin C. Okay, so besides diet and exercise, what else do you think is important to do to be in good health? I swear by my chiropractor, and I know not everybody likes a chiropractor, but especially during this whole lockdown thing when I couldn't work out with a trainer, I stuck with my chiropractor. For me, it was a, an essential business. And so I go once a week and have my spine adjusted, whether or not I need it, just keeps everything flowing right. And also a positive attitude, That's those are crucial for me. Okay, yeah, that makes sense too. And how do you keep your attitude really positive in, in 2020? She lives with me. Wow. <laughs> I'm fortunate. I'm pretty positive in general. <laughs> she okay. excels in attitude. <laughs> Phyllis is always, always happy. And she's always a can-do person. And everything's funny for me. So that helps. Yeah, you do sometimes laugh. And I go, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> like right now. Okay. So here's the last question. If someone said they were too busy to exercise or eat right, or were just leading an unhealthy life in general, what is the first thing you would encourage them to do to get on a better path without being too overwhelmed? Obviously, the first thing is to make a decision that you need to change, whatever it is. And then I would say very small baby steps to start out with any kind of uh resolution or program, decide you want to do something and then take very small steps and just start paying attention to what you are currently doing, what you're currently eating, just keep kind of keep track. It's an education. This is what I'm currently doing. I did that with my Fitbit thing. I had no idea how many steps a day, so I just started letting it keep track and I realized every hour it was reminding me and I'd look and I'd go, hmm, not going to make my 250 this hour. And I did that the first part of the whole lockdown thing. And then I finally got myself moving every hour, just baby steps, keeping track. And then start from there, you know, add in more, you know, cutting back on things or paying attention to what you're eating. And the other big part for me that I've done my whole life, you can't consider it an optional part of your life. It has to be necessary. It's not something you say, oh, I don't feel like doing it today. It really can't be optional. It has to be something that you do. And right. then be positive again. I guess I'll throw out the audience might want to know, you know, steps. So how many are we talking about? She's trying to hit 10,000 steps a day. 10,000. I'm not quite there yet. I did one day and my knee hurt. So <laughs> <laughs> we have to build up to that. So the treadmill will come in very handy for me once it's in. Well, yeah, right now you're just kind of walking around the house, right? Yes. I think in the Zoom shoot that we saw, I think we saw 
Phyllis taking steps behind us while it was happening. Oh, she's notorious for breaking into the scene. <laughs> steps are important. Okay, Mom. Well, thank you for joining us and giving your, us your opinion. And that's our show for today. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, See you next time on The Rebel Show.